policy and training director with the Coalition for Strong Nebraska. Um, I will, um, am joined with my colleague, director of the coalition, Lori ponzi Loggi. So the two of us will go through a couple of the slides that we have for you and feel free to answer or to give us any questions that you may have and we'll walk through um, answers for you. So this is Advocacy 201. It follows what we did a couple of weeks ago before the new year where we talked about Advocacy 101. So you can always get the link um, from Hannah with the recording with the slides and the, and the webinar recording. But just uh, to briefly catch you up from where we were to where we are now, um, we will uh, get to our agenda in just a moment. But we, we started with the best way to start thinking about advocacy for your organization is to look at your organization's mission and then select some related policy issues. If your organization deals with food, um, then it, it may, might make the most sense for you to engage on food related policy. So, you know, thinking about that. And then we talked about the different ways to lobby your state senators or elected officials. So you can lobby by email, you can lobby by phone, you can have in-person meetings, or you can do committee testimony, which is important in the legislative session. And then we also talked about how to track your lobbying activities and what that looks like. So um, if you need to register as a lobbyist in Nebraska, or can you participate normally in the course of your organization's uh, business in terms of responding to requests from lawmakers for information. So all of that was included in our Advocacy 101. So I encourage you to um, take some time and, and look through that webinar and those links and, and reach out if you have any questions. And now we will transition to Advocacy 201. So our agenda for today, we're gonna give you an overview of the 2021 legislative session. It just kicked off on Wednesday this week. So this is perfect timing to let you know what's happening this session, what may be different from previous sessions. We'll talk about some of the new senators who have been elected or reelected to their positions in charge of legislative districts. Um, the first day of the legislative session, they uh, elect chairs. So all of the standing committees, there's 14 standing committees. So all of those committees um, have new or returning chairs. So we'll talk through that. And then we'll really give you some nice tools to think about engaging. The legislative website is your homepage for information. Um, the contact information, we'll talk about the legislative calendar. Um, and then we'll move into where they are right now, which is in bill introduction. And that's the first 10 days of the legislative session. They get to introduce new bills for consideration. So once a bill is introduced, then it goes through the legislative process. So we'll explain that so you know where the bills are that you may be interested in and the process. And then we'll give you some information on public access and hearings. As you know, everything's changed with COVID-19 and the legislature is adjusting to what types of procedures it will have in place for the public to engage as the first house. So we'll give you information on that and what you can expect. And some of the things that CSN has been working on in partnership with nonprofits to ensure that um, nonprofits and community members can have their voices heard even in a time of limited public access in the buildings. We wanna make sure that there is an opportunity for online testimony, for example, um, that could then um, supplement the information that's happening in person in hearings. And then we'll talk about some of the major policy issues. So, you know, there, there will be hundreds of bills that will be introduced this session, but what are the key areas that lawmakers are gonna be focused on and where you all might want to engage as nonprofits? So we'll talk about some of those policy issues as well. Um, before we get to all of that, we just want to give you a grounding. If you're new to learning about who CSN is and what our mission and vision are, we just want to let you know that we're statewide, we're nonpartisan, nonprofit coalition. We're focused on structural public policy solutions that impact poverty and that are informed by the individuals 
whose lives are most impacted by poverty. So we want to make sure that we're uplifting the voices of people who are struggling in our state and are in need of policymakers listening to their stories and understanding how the decisions that they make can improve the lives of Nebraskans. And our overall vision is in Nebraska where public policies ensure that everyone has an opportunity to thrive. So we do this mostly through our coalition work. It's a collaborative with over 100 Nebraska nonprofits who are all focused on poverty alleviation through public policy engagement. So we believe that there often are policy solutions to ending poverty. And that's what we're focused on as a coalition. And we have what's called a ladder of advocacy. So we take nonprofits in on whatever rung they think they're on, um, whether they just have interest in engaging in public policy, they have a little bit of a knowledge, maybe you, you did Advocacy 101, and now you're ready for some more skill development and experience. And then we wanna make sure that our nonprofits that are on our top rung, our expertise rung, that they're reaching back and mentoring other nonprofits as we build a large coalition of organizations and individuals across our state that are engaged in public policy solutions that can improve the lives of Nebraskans. So here's an overview of the Nebraska unit camera. There are 49 state senators. Each senator's office has two positions. So there's a administrative aide and a legislative aide. So your, your administrative aide does a lot of the office management um, for each senator, scheduling, meetings, messages, you know, calendaring for the state senator. And then the legislative aid works on the policy issues. So uh, if you're looking to schedule a meeting, you most likely work with the AA. If you wanna make a phone call and give your opinion about a particular policy or issue, you can leave a message with the AA. If you're wanting to work on um, policy ideas, or you have a question or you think something could be amended to make it better, or amended to make it not as bad, um, you might wanna reach out to the legislative aide or the committee council, which is the person that works with the committee that is listening to each bill. So an odd number of years, so we're in 2021, the legislature has what's called the long session. It's 90 days. Um, so each, you know, the legislature operates in two year cycles. So you have a long session and then you have a short session. So we're in the long session of the 107th legislature. So it goes 90 days, typically from January to June. So those are 90 working days. There are several recess days in between and weekends. So it's typically spread out over a six month ish period. And then short sessions are January through April. Senators can serve a maximum of two consecutive four year terms. So the, we are in the age of what's called term limits. So senators only have eight years total if they're reelected in between. Um, and then they must sit out a term and then they can run again. And so we, we have already seen that happen where we've had senators who have been term limited, who have sat out and then have been reelected and returned to the body. And Lori's gonna go through a little bit of that moving forward. Um, the last thing we just wanna make sure you're aware of is your homepage for advocacy is the nebraskalegislature.gov site. Um, once you start getting used to it, it's wonderful because you can search bills by topic, by the senator that introduced it, by a committee, if you're interested in education issues or transportation issues, um, you know, you can search by committee and topic. And so it really is your repository for all the information you need, the bill number, um, a description of the bill, you can actually read the text, you can see what committee it's going to, you can see um, all of the instances where it's been mentioned in the written journal is on the website. So you'll wanna go there. Um, so Lori is going to tell us about some of the new senators that took office this week and those that are returning to the body. Thank you, Joe. Um, hopefully I'm on, I can't see. Okay. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm Lori Ponce. I'm director of the Coalition for a Strong Nebraska. I have um, 
came to this job just a year ago uh, after spending 20 years as a legal counsel for three different committees in the legislature. Um, excuse me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the new senators and what's going on with the legislature that's new uh, this year. Uh, so just to start off, new senators we who took their oath of office this week. Um, most of them are from the Omaha area. Senator uh, Elliot Bostar from Lincoln, Senator John Kavanaugh, who's from Omaha, Senator Jen Day, who is also from Omaha, Senator Terrell McKinney from Omaha, and Senator, Senator Rita Sanders from Bellevue. Also taking their oath this week are senators who have previously served in the legislature. Senator Aguilar from Grand Island, who defeated Senator Quick from Grand Island. Uh, Senator Mike Flood um, filling a seat that was vacated through term limits by uh, Senator Scheer. And Mike Flood, as you may know, he was previously speaker of the legislature, um, but he is now in a, in a just a regular senator right now. Senator Rich Pauls from Omaha has also rejoined the legislature. Um, these senators and have been told and, and I'm sure they realize that they have come back to a very different legislature and um, I think they um, are waiting to get their feet wet and to see how things have changed since they've been since they were last members of the legislature. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Uh, we had committee chair elections this week. As you know, uh, or may not know, is that chairs are elected by the entire body and you vote that each senator votes for a committee chair via secret ballot if there is a challenge. Um, some, most of the committees actually, uh, there was, there were no challengers and previous senators who were chairs just resume their seats such as appropriations and revenue. There was, and judiciary, uh, no opposition to the current chairs, so they maintained their seats. There were a few challenges though. Um, Senator Matt Hansen, who was chair of business and labor for the past two years, was unseated by Senator Ben Hansen. Um, and that was a close vote, but uh, Senator Hansen, Ben Hansen is the new chair of business and labor. Um, Senator Groney from North Platte, um, who most of you probably know about or have heard of, uh, was defeated in his uh, attempt to retake the education committee chair by Senator Lynn Walls. Um, the first round of voting, it was tied. And so they had to take another vote. And the second vote, Senator Walls came out on top by two votes. So Senator Groney also lost his chair uh, this year. New Senator um, taking over for Health and Human Services is Senator Arch, who was previously on the Health and Human Services Committee. He takes over for Sarah. Senator Sarah Howard. Um, and another contested vote was the vice chair of the executive board. Senator Vargas has held that seat. He was challenged by uh, Senator Slama and um, he won, I think, by two votes. So while our legislature is nonpartisan and um, parties are not recognized on the legislative floor. I think it's um, very telling about the quality and the opportunity that we have in our state legislature to not have parties controlling everything, bills that are introduced in committee chairs. Uh, it's a, it's a, a blessing, I think, because senators are allowed to choose 
the person they think is best for the job, not going by party. There is a mix of senators and parties who are committee chairs. And that's really a, um, because of our nonpartisan unicameral. So we're grateful, we're grateful to have that um, on our side. Okay. Um, as Joe mentioned, the legislative website is the legislature, Nebraska legislature.gov is so full of information. Um, on the front page, I let me see if I can make this work. It might not work right now, but anyway, on the legislature's website, you can find the on the front page the information about all of the new senators, their contact information. Right now, uh, most of the new senators and some of the um, nor uh, some of the incumbents don't have office numbers. Um, they don't know where they're going to be officing. Uh, there, all this week will be a transition week for the legislature, and they um, it will be difficult to figure out where they are and what their number is. Um, so email is probably the best way to reach out to a senator for the next week or so. Um, but that contact information is all available on the website, as well as the legislative calendar, um, which shows beginning opening day all the way to day 90, which will be in June. Um, so encourage you to take a look at the legislature's website. Let me go to the next one. Okay. So where we are in the legislative process right now uh, is bill introduction, which just started yesterday. Um, I didn't catch the number we're at so far, but I think we're still under 200. Um, the last day of bill introduction is on January 20th. Um, each bill that gets referenced, and you may know this already, Every bill that's introduced gets a committee hearing. And that is also something that is um, a benefit to having a unicameral legislature. Uh, the process on every bill is open to the public, uh, though that will be somewhat restricted this year because of COVID, but I'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, every bill gets a hearing. Um, Hearings start, and it just was announced this morning that they will start a week later than usual. Uh, January 25th will be the first day of committee hearings. And that is because the speaker is working with the committee chairs and, and uh, other offices in the legislature to revise committee procedures so that um, safe, hearings can be held. Um, so um, that's an interesting uh, development. That's something that has not happened before, but uh, hearings start on the 25th. Um, as you all know, um, Joe, did you want to go through some of the, the, what we have on the video for Coalition for a Strong Nebraska? Sure. Uh, we have an animated video that is available on our website, strongnebraska.org, uh, also on YouTube. And really, it just takes you to, through the legislative process. Um, if anyone's old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock, um, there was a little animated video about a bill. Uh, so we've done something similar at the coalition. Uh, and essentially, it walks you through a nonprofit has an idea, they take that idea to a senator, the senator introduces it as a bill, um, it gets referenced to a committee. So based on the topic of the bill, uh, it goes to a, a standing committee. So if the bill addresses education, it goes to the education committee. If it's about transportation, it goes to transportation. If it's about taxes, it goes to revenue. So each bill goes to the committee, there's a committee hearing. Um, and then if it's advanced out of committee, there are three rounds of debate. So it starts with general file. And then if it uh, gets 25 votes, it goes to select file. And then another 25 votes and it goes to final reading. 
And then if it passes final reading, um, then it goes to the governor for his or her signature. Um, so the governor typically has, uh, it has five days to either sign the bill, veto the bill, or um, do nothing, and then it becomes law after the fifth day. So this is a little picture of what the animation looks like. There's our bill coming out of bill drafting and um, talking to the senator, and then we have our nonprofit um, staff and individual that had an idea for the law. So it's a really cute video um, in Nebraska. Um, students learn about state policy and, and the unicameral in the fourth grade. So if it's been a really long time since you were in fourth grade, this video is a nice refresher for you to think about. So Lori, if you'll tell us what's gonna be different this year during COVID-19. Thanks, Joe. Uh, memo just came from the speaker this morning uh, about how hearings and executive sessions are gonna be held with the committees. It's very different. They're still in the process of figuring out what that's going to look like to make sure that uh, safe and healthy procedures are in place for the safety of senators and the public. Um, one of the biggest things, and I, from talking with a couple of committee clerks and legal counsels, they still don't know how this is going to happen, but uh, there will be social distancing in the committee hearings. Uh, it, the public capacity for most of the hearing rooms is 27 audience members. Um, that is a very low number, especially for some of the bills that have a great deal of public interest. Um, right now, the speaker is asking the chairs and the committee clerks to try to plan ahead and be flexible regarding participation from the general public. That's very vague guidance. And I know that they are struggling to figure out um, who gets into the room, if it's first come, first serve, um, what happens with overflow, how will people be able to switch places or does do the same 27 people get to stay in the hearing room? It will be a challenge and it will be interesting to see what they come up with. Um, each hearing room, except for 1113, which is the judiciary hearing room, they will have one door identified as a single entrance um, and one door identified as the exit from the room. Um, so also try to protect the public health is uh, the pages will disinfect the testifiers table and the chair and the microphone between each speaker. Um, it, we think that it's going to be uh, very, very different, and I'm not sure how it's going to be handled. And to a degree, we have uh, a concern about how the public is going to be able to sufficiently participate in public hearings. Um, it's different for everyone. Lobbyists uh, are somewhat cut off from the um, from the senators. Lobbyists are not allowed in the in the balconies. The public is will not be allowed in the balconies. Um, the senators will only go to the chamber through the back doors. The front glass doors will be locked. Uh, the sergeants at arms will not be delivering notes to senators like they used to. If somebody, a lobbyist or a member of the public, wants to talk to a senator who's on the floor for, during debate. Uh, those notes will not go back and forth. Um, so access to our, our legislators during, during debate is going to be limited. And um, everyone is encouraged to wear masks. As you, if you've watched the legislature and have seen on TV, they're not all of the senators um, are following that guidance. And um, there's really not, not much to be done about it. Uh, and in that same vein, a lot of senators' offices will be open, business as usual, and some senators' offices will probably be closed with the doors locked. Um, it just depends on the senator, how they want to handle um, a, a, the public's and the public participation and visitation. 
Um, let's see. So online testimony, a, a little more about that. We, the coalition and a number of organizations statewide signed on to a letter and maybe some of you did to the legis to the executive board to the clerk of the legislature and just this morning we resent it to all of the senators asking them to consider a policy that would allow for online submission of testimony and letters um, it is uh, something that they have talked about for a long time. Other states do allow online submission of testimony. We think that it's a way for organizations and members of the public who have limited access, who want to stay safe, uh, members of the public who live far away and wouldn't have a chance to may not have a chance to get into a hearing room, even though they've traveled a great distance to be at a hearing. So we think um, it's, a, it's a viable solution. I don't know if they have enough time or have the capacity to do it for this session, but um, we're strongly encouraging them to try. So um, we will keep you everyone up to date. If you're on our mailing list, we'll keep you up to date on the response we hear from that. And as the speaker said, over the next couple of weeks, they're trying to figure out how they are going to um, modify procedures to ensure public participation, because that is an important part of the process. And um, certainly we don't want only paid lobbyists to have access to senators this session, uh, especially with major policy issues that we're going to be talking about. So um, the next slide, Joe. Some of the major public policy issues. Um, okay, I was just looking at a question in chat. When do we expect to have more information about public access during public hearings? Do you expect they will implement a hybrid structure due to limited capacity and the best way to stay up to date on this? As I said, they, they don't know. They genuinely don't know what they're going to do right now. Um, it, within the next week or so, I think they'll have a better idea. Um, it depends on if they have the capacity with technology to be able to accept online um, vir or virtual testimony. Um, right now, committee clerks, when you, people send in letters for the record, the committee clerks have to make copies of each of those letters and distribute them to hard copies, distribute them to the senators because senator, most senators don't use their laptops and some of them don't even allow it in the committee hearings. And so it's going to take somewhat of a culture change to get senators comfortable with um, using technology to, um, to do their work and to read bills and read amendments and to read uh, correspondence from the public. And that may be the most difficult sell um, as far as moving to uh, online or virtual testimony. Um, major policy issues, every, every odd year, uh, the legislature is required to adopt a biennium budget. It's a two-year budget and that it will be a major thing. And in fact, the only thing um, that the legislature is legally obligated to do is to adopt the budget. Um, we, um, we expect that to be a contentious thing. Obviously it usually is. One of the big things that um, is expected to be in the budget is Senator Ricketts will be, or I'm sorry, Governor Ricketts will be asking for, I think it's 115 million for a new prison. Um, some believe that that's necessary, some don't. And uh, so that will be a very huge expenditure in the budget and um, expect to hear a lot of debate about that. And also, uh, 
depending on what happens with um, tax reform and tax bills, uh, that obviously affects what the budget will do. If you if there's an effort to continue to reduce property taxes or income taxes, certainly that affects revenue and will uh, determine whether what needs to be cut from the budget. So it's important to keep an eye out for that. If there are programs that you work with or um, support to keep an eye, we have to keep an eye on what, um, what happens to the budget if there are additional property tax cuts. Um, revenue has to come from somewhere. But one of the things that uh, has been introduced, I believe already, is uh, for an additional source of revenue is the sales tax on food, which is an always a controversial policy. It's always been uh, stopped and um, it's uh, very contentious and affects people that um, who are the, a lot of the people that we serve. So expect a lot of those types of tax policy discussions um, that will affect people statewide and it will affect the budget. Another major policy issue is redistricting, which the legislature is required to do uh, this year. Um, the executive board of the legislature chooses the redistricting committee. The, uh, it, it, the law requires that um, a certain number of the members of the redistricting committee come from um, a certain one of the political parties. It, it will end up that there will be five Republicans and four Democrats on the redistricting committee. Um, this is a process that, again, unfortunately, uh, will involve politics, the political parties getting involved. Um, there will be rural urban discussions. It's likely that the rural areas of the state will see, will, will lose a seat, uh, or maybe even two. Um, and the urban areas have grown, and so they need more repre representation to represent um, the growing number of people in their districts. So that's controversial, and um, that will take up a lot of time this session. Also, uh, so I have one question. We have one question that popped up that I think would be easier to answer now. Um, can you please reiterate as to how the grocery tax is strategically inserted as a way to fo take focus from other things in the proposal? Well, um, as the legislature has been trying in the last few years to reduce taxes, that's um, a huge issue for the governor and uh, something that he pushes every year and a large number of senators do is we have to reduce taxes. Taxes are too high in Nebraska. Um, schools spend too much money. We uh, need to reduce the amount of property taxes that people pay for their property, par particularly in the agriculture industry. So as they continue to look for ways to reduce taxes, you have to have some other revenue source to make up for it. And um, a lot of people believe that imposing the sales tax on food is a, a good equalizing tax. Everybody has to pay it. And it's um, a viable source of additional revenue. Um, and of course, others believe that, that it hurts people who have limited incomes and um, already rely on public benefits. And um, it's, we believe, a regressive tax and um, that it will be something controversial and I, who knows what will happen with it. Senator Chambers has been a champion of opposing that tax in the past. I don't, I, there are likely several more new um, 
champions of the issue and um, but we'll have to see how the votes come down. Um, there will there are a number of bills that will be in response to COVID-19. Uh, as you know, the legislature uh, appropriated money last year for the state's response to COVID. Um, and the federal government acted with giving CARES money last year. And as you know, they've just completed a, an additional approval of appropriations to states for COVID response. Um, we don't know yet how the new CARES money is going to be distributed or how it's the program's going to work. Uh, last year, senators, as you, if you remember, the session was split into two because of COVID. They finished session, I think it was in August, um, which normally would have been done in April. And um, there were a few bills introduced to try to control how some of that federal COVID money is used or the state COVID money. And most of those uh, bill, they were not successful. So this year, you will see a number of bills in response to COVID to make some of the emergency responses uh, permanent or part of state law. There's been a lot of concern about evictions and um, uh, the governor at one point introduced a directive to halt evictions. The federal government has done that also. Some senators want to make it, um, put it into state law, including paid sick leave, um, support for workers, safety, um, frontline workers, essential workers. Uh, utilities assistance is something that Nebraskans are still having a very difficult time with and finding support for um, access to food, as you all very likely know, is, is something that is still very needed in Nebraska and in record numbers. And um, uh, quality childcare, um, everything that's happened with COVID affecting workers, affecting families, and has a lot to do with childcare and how it is offered and who, um, where it's offered. So there will be a lot of policy suggestions in response to COVID in these matters. So that makes for a very, very busy and full session. So when we talk about um, what you can do and how you reach out to your senator and let them know what you're dealing with in, in your organization or your part of the state. I first want to stress the importance of doing so. I think that a lot of senators, as they look at these uh, tax policies and work on the budget, they, if unless you in your community, your organization and in your community, let them know what you're dealing with, the struggles you're having, the barriers that make your job more difficult. Um, if you don't let them know, they will act uh, maybe in a way that uh, goes against or doesn't help you with your job. They need to know where services are lacking, they um, they just need to know. And, and you may think, well, I'm a service provider. I don't really do that. I, um, I'm not somebody who is involved in lobbying. Um, doesn't, not, maybe you're not comfortable contacting your state legislate, legislator. I just wanna stress the importance of doing so and let you know that especially frontline service providers, um, anyone who works with the public, you have a voice and you, your word is very important with senators. And I think most senators would really appreciate hearing from you and the challenges that you're dealing with. And, um, and a lot of senators rely on data. Anecdotal information is important, but even 
greater uh, to have greater strength in your argument is to have data um, numbers of people that you are serving, the increase in number of people you're serving, um, increase in need and amount of money that, um, that you need to serve your constituency. Um, but stories are important too. Some senators react more to data. Some senators react more to, um, to stories. So it's important to have both. And um, the more stories from a senator's own district has a lot of strength um, because they pay more attention. Senator from Western Nebraska and Scotts Bluff may not um, have a reaction to the evictions that are happening in Omaha, but uh, will react more and um, probably care a little bit more to um, housing needs in his own district. So it's important to gather that information the best that you can and to um, get it to your senator through a letter, through a phone call, probably a letter or an email is most important right now, but don't ever assume that the information you have isn't um, important because it is, and it is effective. Um, and to also make use of people, if you are an organization that has a board of directors or a steering committee, use those resources, have those board members also contact policymakers. The more people that they hear from, um, the more impact that it will have. Can you go to the next slide? So this we've uh, already talked about, but when you think about whether you need to reach out to your Senator um, or to any member of the legislature, uh, what you, and this, uh, these are things that the Coalition for a Strong Nebraska will be working on this year with organizations who want to be more involved in policy. I know we promised this last year, but COVID got in the way of a lot of what we were planning um, on doing with the coalition and the changes we were um, planning to make. We are, it's happening now and it's happening this year. And these are things that we will be offering um, training and webinars on. Um, so look out for that. If you're not a member of the coalition, it, it's free to sign up. Just let us know you want to be a member. And um, what we will talk about and, and um, help you with is to decide uh, if your organization needs to have a public policy plan, or maybe it's just a, a single issue that you're concerned about. Um, huge, huge effect is collaboration with other nonprofits. There are advocacy organizations uh, who operate out of Lincoln or Omaha who push for policy that you may be interested in and they need your information. They need your support and your data to add capacity, to add the number of people who talk to senators um, about a problem. It, we need more capacity. So consider that your organization and what you deal with is, can, is something that will be useful towards policy as part of a bigger group. And um, that's something we uh, will be working on this year. Right now, you don't need to uh, be part of a coalition or have a public policy agenda to reach out to your senator if there's something going on in your part of the state or your organization, reach out now. Uh, they appreciate hearing from the district much more so than a lobbyist in Lincoln. So don't hesitate to do that now. And um, senators, it doesn't have to be super formal. They just appreciate information from your district. And if that's something that you're hesitant to do or want help with, um, let, let us know at the coalition. And that's something we're happy to help you with. Um, uh, 
some of the things that we will also work on is uh, coordinating strong committee hearings. And a lot of this is strategy as we work on the different policies that include um, addressing opposition, creating a, a good hearing and um, keeping you informed and in, in how to stay engaged and how to uh, deal with senators after a policy has passed or has failed is very important too. So those are things that we will be working on um, throughout the year and developing our programs around. So stay tuned to that. And um, we hope to develop programs that will be helpful to you and your organization to uh, ensure that the public is served um, the public who don't have a voice in Nebraska as large as other organiz uh, businesses, bigger, bigger industries do. So that's what we want to do through the coalition. And with that, I'll let Joe tell you about our these remaining um, seminars with Nam. Joe, you're on myself, here. sorry. Um, thank you, Lori, and th thank you all for joining us. And um, so please start putting in any questions you may have in the Q&A box um, or in the chat. So we'll, we'll have a couple minutes to answer any questions that you have about our current legislative session or anything related to public policy advocacy. But we just wanna make sure you know that We've got three more fabulous sessions coming up in our Power Up Your Nonprofit Voice. So January 22nd, we're gonna do the next stage of this. So we had Advocacy 101, this is Advocacy 201, and now we're gonna talk about grassroots advocacy, how you can help your constituents advocate. And so we are partnering with our friends at the Nebraska Civic Engagement Table because they have a lot of the tools resources in terms of field work and organizing to help you think about who your clients are, who uh, are community members or neighbors or individuals that you want to advocate around the policy ideas that you care about, whether you're wanting to support a policy or oppose a policy. Um, so you'll really want to tune in to uh, that presentation on the 22nd. Um, there are tools such as utilizing voter registration information to create lists of people who might be likely uh, supporters of the issue that you're thinking about. They also have a texting program so you can try to activate people to call a senator um, and, and tell them your opinion about a particular issue or encourage them to vote um, yes or no on a bill that's in front of them. So that's uh, those are really good and helpful tools and information for you. And then February 12th, we have how to use the 2020 census data and redistricting. So as Lori mentioned, that is gonna be a major public policy issue this year. Um, and so we wanna be able to take a look at how you can use the census data uh, in combination with what you're experiencing as an organization, the data points that you are gathering about needs in our community, how you can use census data to augment um, what you're already collecting and presenting that in a way um, that senators and their staff will be interested in learning about what the issues are. And then we'll wrap up with public student loan forgiveness and an update on that program. So all of these again are gonna be 12 to one through Zoom. If you go ahead and click on the links to register, then you'll get the link prior to the start of each webinar and then you'll have access to the recordings afterwards. So are there any questions? Question. Yep. Can you go into more detail regarding the committee hearings and how um, CSN can support nonprofits with those? Okay, um, is the person asking about how to get involved in the committee hearing? So. How would a nonprofit, I'm, I, I think it's how would a nonprofit get involved in a committee hearing and how can CSN support those who might want to? Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, so, if you're paying attention to what's happening in the legislature and a bill that you're interested in when it gets scheduled for a committee hearing. So NAM and the coalition and our partners at the Nebraska Civic Engagement Table 
are doing weekly public policy calls. And those are gonna be every Tuesday at noon. There's a Zoom link and it'll be the same link throughout session. The password is policy wins. So it's a capital P, capital W, policy wins. Um, so that's a great way to learn about what bills are moving and when committee hearings are scheduled. So that's probably the first part. And then if your organization is interested in testifying at a committee hearing, you can reach out to Lori or myself and we will connect you with other nonprofits that are also participating in that committee hearing. So what our goal is, is that we may have one or two nonprofits that have typically um, be, been advocate leaders on a particular issue and are coordinating a public hearing when the hearing is scheduled. So we wanna make sure that all the nonprofits that are interested in the same issue get connected and so you can strategically plan for a strong committee hearing. Um, and then if you're interested in learning about, you know, how do you create your testimony? If you want one of us to take a look at your testimony and help you edit it or practice and kind of walk through that, you can reach out to us as well to help you with technical assistance. Any other questions? That is all I see right now. I put some links in the chat to help people, um, including the Zoom link for that, those calls. Um, so I think that's all we have right now. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. If you haven't joined the coalition, please join. We're doing some great revisions with our website where um, you will also have access to a bill tracker and get a lot of great information from our website. So that will be coming in the next couple of weeks. And um, thank you. And um, hope to talk with you all again soon. Thank you, everyone.